So I want to start off by saying I have no uh, uh, conflicts of interest, at least none of the normal sort. But as someone who lives in Israel and provides OB anesthesia care to a very diverse population, both diverse physicians and diverse patients, um, I will be touching on some fairly hot topics. Um, the interface between religion and state and medicine is very big news in the last few weeks, particularly in the United States, um, not just in the Middle East, but also where I'm also working, which is in the Midwest, uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, and we'll discuss that briefly. But I'm not going to engage in any of the politics associated with these topics, um, but I'm just going to try to tell my story from a medical perspective. This is the hotel where 50 years ago, I think this month, uh, the peace bed in of John Lennon and Yoko Ono took place. Actually, there, was, there were two host hotels. One was in Amsterdam, and one was supposed to have been in the Bahamas, but it was too hot. So they came here, which was clearly not too hot. Um, <laughs> but this is where they sang, P give peace a chance. So I'm not really going to talk about achieving peace. I don't think as physicians we're going to be able to make peace. But I think that from each in their own little micro environment can do their bit. So my first glimpse of the role that medicine and anesthesia can play in, in making peace was when I was flown as a member of the Israeli army to the Rwandan refugee crisis in 1994. Our very circuitous route in red is because uh, we had to sort of try to bypass and not tread over the areas of some of our less uh, welcoming neighbors. Um, and we saw the devastation following the uh, genocide of Tutsis and then the Hutu-Tutsi civil war that followed it. And uh, as the area around Lake uh, Kivu in uh, the Congo is volcanic rock and there was no water runoff, then the human waste from the survivors and the decomposing bodies of the, uh, of the victims led to a uh, huge cholera epidemic with an unprecedented mortality. And uh, so we went uh, as a humanitarian m uh, mission and we treated both um, Tutsis and Hutus, the town of Goma, which was where we were sighted, had increased in population from 100,000 to 2 million over the course of a week. Um, here is a picture of a uh, boy standing in the street with these um, decomposing bodies. This is a child who had been uh, macheted and then taken off a funeral pyre. Um, and we were very conscious uh, going into a, a, a zone like this as, in some cases, children of or families of Holocaust survivors not to write tattoos on arms and so numbers. Patients had to have hospital numbers which were inscribed on their heads or their chests or anywhere but not on their arms. But it was, it was very, we were very um, clear that as, as physicians going to an area like this that I think that particularly a mission from Israel had a particularly strong um, role to play and we saw the ravages of war and the man-made consequences whether it be hunger, malnutrition and disease. And one of the things we had to do was build a, an operating room for um, the traumatic patients and surgical conditions that occasionally arised. We tried to do this as little as possible. I'm actually shocked when I see this photograph how much I have aged since then, which is horrible, but anyway. Um, obviously, if medicine can kill as well as cure, so an army trained for combat has a tremendous capacity for, for saving life, not just for combat. And I think that I saw that in action there. And this was one of nearly 30 humanitarian missions that the Israeli Army Medical Corps have uh, taken part in over the years. So that was my first sort of uh, exposure to anesthesia and peacemaking, if you will. Um, this is the, the sort of the, the embodiment of peace in, in the biblical sense. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. 
from Isaiah, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war anymore. This is engraved over the entrance to the United Nations building in New York, which um, um, a building which is um, has to make lots of uh, possibly compromises over um, over trying to keep peace to some degree in the world. Um, this is a different wall. Sometimes uh, I think that all peoples of all religions do strive and pray for peace, each in their own way. Yet sometimes it does feel like we're talking to the wall. Um, uh, so rather than trying to discuss the building of bridges of peace, I'm going to try to focus on something that's more attainable, which is to identify and chisel away at some of the fences and the gates that divide different peoples from each other. This We just had in St. Louis the Tennessee Williams um, Festival. And this is a quote from the, from the Knight of the Iguana. I've discovered something to believe in. The priest says something like God, and she says, no, what did you find? She said, the broken gates between people so they can reach each other. And if we look at this, the, the broken gates between people, so here I'm going to try to talk about identifying some of the uh, differences between um, uh, different demographic groups that we have in Israel um, and how, whether this be academic versus clinical practice, center versus periphery, and particularly the Jew versus the Arab or the Orthodox, the, the ultra-religious Jews versus the Arab and Bedouin populations, to what degree are healthcare uh, practices and resource allocations different? And then in terms of the broken gates so that they can reach each other, I will try to discuss some of the forums for communication, whether this be national anesthesia meetings, uh, surveys, academic partnerships, um, even WhatsApp consultation networks that we have tried to establish to enable different practitioners to be able to speak to each other. Um, it's a well hack, uh, sort of a hackneyed phrase, a, 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 a huge cliche these days to, to say think globally and act locally, but there is a lot of truth in this. And it works in two different directions. There is global standards which can be translated into national targets and national policies which then are um, sent to different cities, different hospitals, different um, healthcare uh, providers for action, but then in the other direction, and I believe that this is a very important part of the, of the limb, which is that um, initiatives and projects arise in the field at the level of hospitals or the level of individual practitioners, which can then drive national policies and, in fact, representatives from individual countries or enthusiasts can find international representation which can then change global standards. And I think that to some degree this is something that is uh, possible for um, practitioners not just in the United States but throughout the world to do. Um, so my personal story between 1999 and 2001, I was in Stanford for a research fellowship and when I returned home to Israel in 2001, the first inequality in healthcare that I saw was in the disparity between daytime and nighttime clinical practice. So during the day we had an anesthesiologist in the ward, in the labor ward, and during the nighttime we did not. We had to bring up an anesthesiologist from the, labor, from the operating room every time we needed an epidural whenever there was a caesarean. And what was striking was that the incidence for general anesthesia for emergency caesarean was about fourfold greater at night than it was during the day. And it's likely um, that this either reflects the fact that there was no epidural in place or that there may have been an epidural in place, but by the time someone came up from the operating room to convert it to a epidural anesthetic for caesarean, the patient was already in the sort of uh, um, um, surgical crucifix position with surgeons scrubbed and a knife poised over their abdomen and there was already no time to perform um, a regional conversion. And this 
is not just an analgesic quality measure. This is also a patient safety measure. And this is old data that came out of the confidential inquiries into the United Kingdom, that over the 20 years from the 1970s to the 1990s, there was a dramatic reduction in anesthetic-related maternal deaths in the United Kingdom, almost all of which occurred during emergency caesarean section under general anesthesia. And there was a lot of head scratching. Why had there been such a dramatic reduction in maternal death over that time? Because this was not yeah, pulse oximeter and capnography related um, uh, reductions in maternal death, which came towards the end of the 1980s. This was already starting in the early 1980s. But over the exact same period of time, there was a gradual increase in the popularity of epidural analgesia for labor. And the women who were getting epidural analgesia for labor in those days were the ones who were most likely to go on and get C-section for poor progress. They were the very big babies, small pelvises, poor progress, maybe fetal dis uh, variable decelerations and so forth, so that they were getting epidural analgesia. And when they eventually threw in the towel and brought them for C-section, all we needed to do was to change the syringe and convert an uh, epidural for labor to an epidural anesthetic and didn't have to um, sort of uh, conquer the patient's airway. Whereas prior to that, this was a tired, inexperienced junior anesthesiologist at night coping with a, uh, um, an emergency cesarean delivery and there were associated um, general anesthesia complications. So we were very concerned that if there is a fourfold increase in general anesthetics at night, this is a safety issue and we need to deal with this. So this is one of the motivating factors that we had for restarting the Israel Association of Obstetric Anesthesia in 2002. And I just sort of took down these points which were from a letter that I wrote to the Israel Society of Anesthesia to try to get this revived, that we wanted to have set up a forum for social contact between enthusiasts in obstetric anesthesia and to set up an educational program every three months. And that there would, every time there was a national meeting, there would be an OB anesthesia program at that meeting. We would set up a refresher course for board exams so that every anesthesia resident in the country would get exposed to training in OB anesthesia from people who had been through OB anesthesia fellowships, which had not been occurring to encourage research, to get involved in the training of midwives and doulas if necessary, and to run an, uh, antenatal classes, um, and to encourage members to act locally, and to have an interface with the Israel Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine, which was the obstetric group, and to arrange a joint conference with them, set up professional guidelines and staffing guidelines in particular, and then to set up a fellowship training program. And so by doing so, to maybe encourage people to come to the specialty of OB anesthesia. Within a very short period of time, less than a year, we were having at our meetings somewhere between 50 to 90 anesthesiologists at our three monthly meetings. This represents, on average, about 10% uh, of all of the anesthesiologists in Israel for every week, uh, sort of month, uh, three monthly Friday morning meetings, because there were only 700 anesthesiologists in Israel at that time. So that's a pretty, I think that was a pretty impressive group of people, and the the, the uptake has continued. This is um, since that time, Dr. Yoskovich has been extended the obstetric anesthesia training for residents coming up for their board exams to training for across the specialty. So cardiac, pediatric, pain, ICU, as well as OB anesthesia for as a, as a unified uh, training program for residents coming up for their board examinations. But this is something that basically was, were, was started by what we try to do with OB anesthesia. Um, and we have now sort of gone into the new age. We have now a WhatsApp consultation network. So every OB anesthesiologist in Israel, every center 
where there is a director of OB Anesthesia is in our OB, uh, OB Anesthesia WhatsApp group. So it happens every day that there is a, uh, someone's got a complicated patient, they raise their question, and they get inundated with answers, most of which are good. Um, not always, but they have to be selective as to what their answers are. But there is, they use this for helping them with um, consultation of complicated patients, suggested protocol changes, clinical updates, new papers of interest, drug shortages, what alternatives are available, um, problems with equipment, um, uh, help with obstetric anesthesia complications, um, notifications about forthcoming meetings, even this one, uh, even the meeting in Halifax. Um, and we would have loved to have had this facility when we first set up the OB Anesthesia Society in Israel because in those days we were mailing posters to hospitals. Most of our group did not even have email and we were mailing posters to them to stick up a notice board. So we have sort of seen a huge revolution. So the next plan is once we have set up and established the um, uh, Israel Association of Obstetric Anesthesia in our case, is to look at these same manpower inequalities but at a national level. So we then ran the first of what turned out to be 12 national surveys and studies to assess the practice of OB anesthesia in the country. And we showed that there was a huge variation in obstetric anesthesia practice between different hospitals with at rates of epidural analgesia ranging from about 95% in some hospitals to 9% in others, and a cesarean rate ranging from about 28%, which was about the highest, to 10%, which was at Dr. Yoskovich's hospital, which was about the lowest. I think it's gone up a little bit since then. Um, and we showed that hospitals with a 24-7 OB anesthesia cover had about twice the epidural rate than hospitals who didn't, which is not really surprising. And the hospitals which had a large or predominantly arable Bedouin population were likely to have a far lower epidural rate. Now, this may have been related to the fact that they had um, less um, available staff, but this may also have been a cultural perception that epidurals were not good and it hadn't penetrated into those communities. Um, so we, we were not sure, we felt that we needed to do a, a, a more focused study to work out if there was a cultural, is this a cultural problem or is this a, a resource allocation problem. But when you recall the impact, the consequences of um, not providing our epidural analgesia across the board, we felt that this was a safety issue that needed to be addressed. Um, another problem that we had was up until that time, the Israel Ministry of Health had an, um, a resource allocation equation that had been uh, written many years earlier that related to the number of deliveries and based on that, how many anesthesiologists would be allocated to labor, um, to, to departments of anesthesia providing OB anesthesia services. Um, but we realized how poor this equation would be because the uh, workload was so different among different hospitals. Some had a high epidural rate, some had low, some had a high C-section rate, and some had low. So we set up a, um, an index, which we called the OB Anesthesia Activity Index, which was based on a gross number that was determined by an, a minimum of 30 minutes for a safe epidural, five minutes to take, get a cons consent, another five to 10 minutes to perform the epidural and to stick around for at least 15 minutes after the epidural has been performed. And a typical 90 minutes for an Israeli C-section. That is absolutely emphatically not a St. Louis C-section, but a C-section in Israel from beginning to end would typically be in the region of 90 minutes. That's not skin to skin, but that's anesthesia time. And you can see how radically different different hospitals were. So the, the small graph in the bottom uh, right-hand corner shows at individual hospitals which proportion of the OAAI, what proportion of the activity index was composed of epidurals versus cesarean deliveries. So um, despite that, there were still 
hospitals which had uh, a pretty high activity index, um, yet they still did not have any OB anesthesiologists giving de dedicated cover in labor and delivery suites. Um, they may be having 10 hours of needle, like anesthesiologist on a needle time, like either in the patient's uh, OR or providing epidurals, and yet there would be no dedicated cover, and we felt that that needed to be changed. Um, and in the paper that we wrote, we said that the, we felt that this um, would be a, a, a um, number, a, a denominator that we could use to compare different hospitals from different geographical centers and different cultural realities. Um, and we would hope that it would support a change in healthcare resource allocation. But I think that we can probably say at this point that it did not yet achieve that. Uh, I think that the, we report the OA activity index in every survey that we do, but to date that has not um, impacted uh, health care. But a different area where I think that we have had much more success is, in fact, I'm going to be beating the drum for Sh uh, Sharon Orbach Zinger here, is the impact that had in Israeli OB anesthesia from the studies that she has done with intrathecal morphine. Because prior to th this study, only three centers in Israel were using intrathecal morphine routinely. Um, and the, in fact, in her, this was prompted by a study that was performed in her hospital where they were not using intrathecal morphine. And I'll discuss in a moment a reason why this was why they were not using intrathecal morphine. But they were not using intrathecal morphine, and the postpartum um, VAS scores on day one were six out of ten. Um, and nice requirements is somewhere between is one or lower than three on day one. Um, and across the board, the hospitals that were not using intrathecal morphine had much higher um, postpartum uh, pain scores. And one of the problems with in Israel why we were not why hospitals were not using intrathecal morphine was that they were trying to comply with the ASA guideline on neuraxial opioids, which require hourly nursing observations. And this was something that most hospitals in Israel were unable to provide. Now, they felt, therefore, that they could not give neuraxial morphine. Yet, in, uh, there is no ASA guideline for systemic opioids. And we know that systemic opioids have worse respiratory depression than intrathecal opioids. And it's, I think, an example of the harm that can be done by a, a protocol or a guideline that is then applied across the board to um, healthcare professionals in different realities. So um, um, I, this is, I think, that it's, it's something that we need to all know as people who write protocols that you can actually do harm with these things. Anyway, following her report, the number of centers using intrathecal morphine more or less overnight, within three years, rose from 12% to 44% in 2017. The other point that I find very um, exciting from this report was the three hospitals that in 2014 report were using intrathecal morphine had, were the only three hospitals in Israel at the time where the director of OB anesthesia had had a fellowship in OB anesthesia. And um, that was, um, I think, prior to that time even, but that was, I think, one of the um, strong drivers for us setting up what was in Israel the first fellow uh, recognized accredited fellowship program in anesthesia. So they had had accredited fellowships in ICU and in pain, but this was the first anesthesia related, and I think Pediatrics started this year, but up until now, we were the only accredited specialty in Israel with a fellowship program. Um, we also set up a, um, a snapshot study so that for a 72-hour snapshot, every hospital in Israel had um, observers come and watch, particularly what was the time between setting, requesting an epidural and getting an epidural? Did they eventually get one, etc.? Um, 
unfortunately, we were not able to address the question of Arab and Bedouin um, healthcare provi provision because the major HMO in Israel refused to, at the last minute, to allow access to their hospitals. And most of the hospitals looking after Arabs and Bedouins are in that group. But certainly we were able to address the um, ultra-Orthodox um, uh, Jewish um, uh, demographic. And in fact, there was a slight increase in uh, epi uh, the epidural analgesic service was better in their group um, than it was in the general population. That was not always the case. So I think that there is a definite penetration of the needs and qualities of epidural analgesia in the ultra-Orthodox Jewish population. Since that time, there have been multiple different studies and surveys by the OB Anesthesia Association, mostly driven by Dr. Yoskovich and Dr. Zinger and Dr. Weiniger, who's not here, on a range of things, ranging from amniotic fluid embolism treatments and uterotonics and postural puncture headache prevalence and the approach to dealing with them and um, transfusion management and previa, which was already presented, and aseptic techniques. Um, post-operative pain control. And I think that across the board, this society has been able to sort of um, impose change on national practice in obstetric anesthesia. It's not just in the re so I'm s not just in the realm of OB anesthesia. I think that um, th this sort of the concept of medicine, if you will, as a bridge to peace has um, um, broader connotations. In, in recent years, we have seen terrible um, ravages in, amongst our neighbors, uh, particularly in Syria, and we have been treating some 5,000 Syrian civilians who've managed to sneak over the border at night to go and get medical attention, um, or some trauma patients, and this has been quite a, a large phenomenon, particularly in the north, Naharia and Sfat hospitals. Um, Palestinians, not, just, not talking about Arabs from within Israel, but Palestinians from the Palestinian Authority coming to um, get treatment in Israeli medical hospitals, um, both the regular civilians and the Palestinian leadership getting treatment in Israeli hospitals. We have in Hadassah, this, this service has actually just moved from my hospital to Sharon's hospital, but we had the only fetal surgical center in Israel, um, and about 50% of our patients were from um, Gaza, from the uh, um, Arab population, Palestinian population in Gaza, where we were doing uh, fetal uh, surgery, including uh, fetoscopic um, uh, spina bifida surgery corrections. But ultimately, coexistence and peace is local, and you, you generate the environment around you. This is a, a hospital in East Jerusalem, which was predominant prior to a few years ago, was a hospital catering to an overwhelming Muslim majority. Um, they now have a change in, uh, in, in um, nursing leadership, um, a sister, and it's a, it caters to both Christians and Muslims and a large amount of Jewish population from Western Jerusalem going to Eastern Jerusalem for labor care. Um, and they talk about this building bridges of peace. And one of the things that, that, that um, it may not speak to all of us, but they are very women-centric in as much as there are birthing, uh, there are water births, and the sort of births that Sharon's uh, cousin would approve of, um, uh, um, and skin to skin, and many things I think they, they have certainly Dem we, we can learn from their ability to listen to, to women. And the, the recent article about this hospital is, is this the birth of coexistence? So I, I strongly believe that most people are essentially good, whether they are Jews or Muslims or Christians or none, black or white, rich or poor, all of us want 
health and security to be able to go to bed at night with an easy heart and put food on the table and educate our children and give them opportunities better than the ones that we had. And I think that at, at the personal level, whether it be meeting people in international meetings like this or treating patients one-on-one -on -one in our delivery units, it is us who can create the, the, the if you will, the bridge to peace. Now, bef I don't feel, I know we've got a f four minutes before the end of this, I don't feel that we can discuss a session, close a session, which is dealing with challenges of modern obstetric anesthesia in a traditional population without touching on an issue which is, I, I, I feel is the challenges now, not in the Middle East, but in the Midwest. And the state where I'm, and I work 30% of my time in Washington University in St. Louis, and Missouri has now passed a, a very strong eight-week abortion ban. And I just want to mention this because the, the reaction of the, um, the OB o, obstetric and gynecology um, division of, the, of ACOG and to contrast that to some degree with the response of the ASA to a previous bill, which I, I think that we need to um, relate to. So I try, I'm going to be very careful and try not to discuss the political issue, but try to discuss the medical issue. We have a problem here as providers. What are we going to do with ectopic pregnancy? Are we going to see more septic abortions? We had very recently in Washington University, a C-section for triplets where there were twin, uh, monozygotic twins and an innocent bystander triplet where there was twin-twin transfusion syndrome, an imminent demise, which was already, by the time they presented, it was too late for um, um, uh, an ablation. Um, and they performed C-section rather than what I think would be probably mostly accepted as better practice, which is a, um, a selective abortion of the um, imminently demising fetus. And this caused uh, the severe morbidity to, to the other two innocent uh, bystanding twins. So there are medical issues associated with this, um, with this law. And the, um, the Missouri section of, the, of ACOG stressed strongly that they were opposed to this law, that Missouri is ranking at almost at the bottom of the United States scale for the highest, worst rates of maternal mortality and morbidity, that this law will only increase that. And this was not the number one uh, priority when it came to the health care of their patients. And I want to contrast that with the Utah law, which I don't know how many of you were aware of, where the governor of Utah passed this law that fetal pain, um, fetuses feel pain during abortion, and therefore, Every abortion in the state of Utah has to have a mandated general anesthetic so that the fetus should not feel pain. So I wrote to the president of the ASA at that time and I said, look, you need to take action on this. What, who is medic, who's going to be responsible when a patient has a politically ma mandated general anesthetic which is maybe medically contraindicated. Some of these patients are the sickest patients who are getting terminations because they're medically unwell. And, um, and there is no scientific basis for the fact that the fetus feels pain prior to 24 to 28 weeks because the neural networks are not there. There's good research from Maria Fitzgerald in University College. So together with SOAP and the American Society of Anesthesiologists, they made the bold statement that SOAP and the ASA hold the patient-physician relationship sacrosanct and medical decisions regarding choice of anesthetic should be patient-centric. And I don't know if anyone on earth knows what the hell they were talking about because the word of politically mandated general anesthetic is not there. So I feel that that is not the leadership that we need and I think that this is a, a medical, not a political, a medical issue that eventually that OB anesthesiologists need to raise their head above the 
barricade and make their point clear. Anyway, I think that I'm open to questions if anyone has any questions for me or for any of the other speakers here. First of all, I want to thank the three of you for a superb afternoon. I couldn't have hoped for a better overview of everything the Israeli uh, Society for Obstetric Anesthesia has done and will continue to do over the next decades under your leadership of all of you who are here. I have a question for you, or more of a, of a comment. Um, I would say that your Bedouin and Arab population in Israel might be perceived as being quite similar to what we have in North America with the Hispanic population. There's a barrier in access to care, then there's a barrier in education about healthcare. There's also a barrier in information and all the cultural sort of challenges. And I really am asking the question because I have no idea. Do you have information that is targeted to them? Is there anything that is done in the community to try and help the Bedouin women have a better understanding what an epidural might even be. They probably don't even know what it is. And we see, we see you know, similar circumstances, not just with the Hispanic population in the US. So I'm interested, since you're a smaller country, maybe a better mix of what you're doing in Israel. So I think there's a distinction between the Bedouin population in the, in the, in the south, in the Negev desert, and um, the Arab population, who are generally far more educated. Um, and um, I think that we have seen definite increase in education and that message getting through over the years that I've been practicing. So that in, in Jerusalem, where we have a large number of our population, our Arab patients, I don't really see a difference between their uh, understanding of the issues involved with epidural or their uptake of epidurals. That's not the situation, I think, in, in the Negev desert with, um, with Bedouin population. Um, but I, as I have no personal experience at all um, I've never worked in Beersheva, so I, I can't really answer that. Maybe uh, some of my colleagues here will be able to answer that one. No. Have, become, have been sexually abused. So it's a very, very difficult population for us. Um, in our hospital, we're trying to institute, we're trying to get to the, their churches to speak to them about epidurals um, because we have a really, really high general anesthesia rate with them, really bad, and they bleed a lot. Um, and we're having really big issues. They also don't have very good prenatal care. We're trying to get into the churches. So far, we're not meeting with success, but I think it's probably because of language barrier. Um, I will maybe just finish with this last slide. This is um, a picture of a guy called Rabbi Abraham de Sola, who was in the um, 1864, I think, or the time when there was a big debate, public debate about whether we can give epidurals, or not epidurals, um, ether or chloroform analgesia to women in labor, and whether this counter countervened the biblical injunction that thou shalt um, deliver in, in sadness or in pain. And there was a very large public outcry, possibly similar to what is happening today um, with the interface between religion and state and medicine. And Rabbi de Sola had a very strong voice saying that no, uh, pain is not a biblical injunction that you must suffer pain. It is, if you will, a biblical curse that we are empowered and even uh, mandated to fight against. And there is no, um, nothing holy in inflicting or, or surrendering to pain. And I think that also in the context of what we discussed uh, recent just now, I think that we need to keep our mind on the fact that not in, in if, if we will, in the binary world between 
pro-choice and pro-life, I think that we need to speak up for maternal life. And that is something that maybe is somewhere between those two. Thank you.